testing, testing. This is I am the sun. I'm gonna play all of part A for you. It starts out. Um, it's <laughs> When it's when it's playing the when it's playing that part, the whole band's gonna be crashing on that, so that's gonna be really intense. And the other part's gonna be laid back. Does a body and actually it doesn't, does it? I mean, in actuality, it's quite porous, and we're completely, in a way, fluidly interconnected with the world around us, and we're just a kind of temporary agglomeration of molecules in the shape of a human body that then, once we die, dissipates into the earth and is fed on by other organisms and. They release gases in the air, people breathe it, and we're all just floating pods in an underwater environment, just dissolving and feeding on each other. I think it's specious to think that our individuality is of really tremendous great worth. And I'm still like totally flummoxed at the fact that I even exist. It just, it just makes no sense to me at all. <laughs> that, that I'm here breathing or that this moment right now just passed and it's gone and where is it where am i right now it's like I'm, the big question is always is like do i really exist I saw you singular creator and I think that puts him within a world uh, for which there are few members sacramental about Swan's music. Michael is reaching in his, whatever this is, you know, in his yearning to make something happen, you know, he's reaching into the mysterious and the sacred, which is what music is. makes Swans unique is that Michael is the real deal. He's crystallizing this vision that he has had. He's still able to um, tap into these, you know, fundaments of, of life and very basic feelings. And there's an honesty and a passion and a realness to what Michael's doing. And he does that at the expense of everything. And when he's in the middle of that musical maelstrom, that's all that matters to create that moment of ecstasy and that moment of euphoria. sense of music is regrouped in one single band. And I feel very lucky 
I've been able to witness this era of swans. survivor sometimes you encounter people like that you know just people that just won't give up you know just you know knock me down but I'm stand back up <laughs> I think his self-consciousness has just been whittled away at over the years so that when you watch him on stage, you feel free. Even when this music is really dark or the words are really twisted or whatever, you know, watching a good performer like Michael and a band that's so beautifully locked in is really liberating. It's almost shamanistic. He's like taken on this job. He's just like, okay, this is my job. I'm Michael Girard, I'm a shaman. Like. <laughs> if they look at it with deep introspection, would see their life as a spiritual journey. This that happens in my case, I leave track marks behind. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veli now. I think the first time I actually heard about Michael Girau in New York was my band, The Coachman. And we were flyering our posters around for our next gig, wherever that was. And I remember being inside the club and the rest of my band came in and they were just furious. And they're like, there's, these, there's this guy outside, he's a total asshole, he's like ripping down our Coachman flyers because we put them on top of their flyers. And it's this band called Circus Mort. And the name Circus Mort sort of stuck in my head because I did see their flyers around. <laughs> put up posters all over the damn city and worked really hard to try and get some kind of attention and following and just played all the time. But the music, although I thought it was good at the time, looking at it now, was your kind of uh, slightly psychedelic new wave music. And I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing because the, the music that I really liked wasn't like that. Stand erect. Watch your body red. We just decided that it wasn't working, I think. I mean. I think the last show we did, we're all on acid, and that was a pretty strange experience. And it just kind of fizzled out. I don't know. So when Circus Mort broke up, actually that night at the band meeting, Michael and I went out to go to a bodega and pick up some beer. And on the way out to that walk, Michael asked me if I wanted to uh, work with him on a project. He already had a name for it. He said, I'm going to call it Swans. I've got a couple different folios of stuff here to show you of swans. There's a couple versions of that shot. There's just a few different prints of it. Now here's an early swans poster. That's the color Xerox original. You know, this is the kind of poster you'd fly paper around town, put on all the derelict buildings with wheat paste. At some point, I took these pictures of swans 
in Michael's apartment in the East Village. These are the ones with the noose. Here you can see the noose. That was Mike's idea, I think. Mike was a very combative person in those days, and I think to make the kind of music he was making, he had to be that way to a degree because it was very aggressive. He was really dredging deep into this uh, darkness, you know, and, and it affected his whole persona. It was a dark period in New York. Mike was living in the midst of that East Village war zone when it was a very heavy time. Just garbage everywhere in the streets. There were intense epidemics of heroin use and a lot of uh, drug-related crime and violence and break-ins. New York was a dangerous place. I got mugged. A guy held a knife to my throat, pushed me against the wall while another guy hovered with a knife, and they took my money. Other than almost shitting my pants, um, it was uh, not fun. And I just was so shaken that I went back home and hid. How difficult it was to make it in New York, to just survive in New York. And I think Mike's aggression towards just what one had to do to live, like in a way you had to debase yourself living in these shitty flats and taking some crappy job in order to make enough money to pay your rent. I mean, I think all of that stuff was an affront to Mike's sensibility in a way, and he wanted to throw it back in a way that he felt reflected what, what he was going through and what he saw around him. definitely had their own unique sort of way of presenting things and it was very much a product of Michael's persona and his aesthetic which seemed very stark. Swan's reputation preceded them immediately upon their first performances as one of the loudest and heaviest, slowest bands to see, and absolutely uncompromising. And so I had to go see Swans, and of course was floored immediately, and in love. Swans are just absolutely brutal, you know, but absolutely beautiful. In the midst of that sound in some of those shows in the early days, it was literally like I'm standing there and I'm sort of body slammed by this sonic event. And it would propel me around the stage, propel me into the monitors, falling on the monitors. Or, and it was just kind of about literally uh, an act of very positive self-destruction. Wanting to make it sound as violent, caustic, abrasive, and emotionally disruptive as possible and basically having a desire for more sound, more, more. My first memory of seeing Swans was at the Pyramid Club. I wasn't quite prepared for the um, overwhelming nature of what Swans was all about. I mean, at that point, it sounded like it, it was really fully formed. It was very all enveloped. Pyramid gig, he just like, I'm gonna come out here, I don't care who you are, I'm gonna decimate. I was on it, like just, just spreading his blood and guts and everything into the audience. And then I went downstairs into the tiny little dressing room, and Michael was sitting there, his eyes like this, and like a stream of snot coming out of his nose, just sort of hanging. And just like, he was like, he couldn't talk. His, his brain, everything was gone. He was just like, he had just expended himself so much on stage that he was just like, 
Like he was like, an, like a feral animal who just like came running out of the woods after like being chased by like you know, a wolf or something and just had been attacked. And he was just like. <sighs> Well, the tempo of it, it was unusual in its tempo. It was very slow. I mean, it was attractive because of that. It was singular. There wasn't anything else like it. It was notable. We stood up and we took note. <laughs> It started slowing down naturally, but uh, to give Jonathan Cain credit, he played me some blues music, uh, and particularly Howlin' Wolf. We don't play evil. There's a Howlin' Wolf song called Evil. And by the way, I'd been obsessed with that song since I was about 14 years old. Where's your long way from home? Can't sleep at night. Grab your telephone call. I just found that to be the most amazing, sensual, primal, Groove possible is uh, particularly the song Evil. The rhythm to Evil was the swing time breakdown that was bop, bop, boom, bop, 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 boom, bop. Okay. There's an early Swan song called Blackout, which basically I was playing Evil. For me, creating the rhythm in Swans was all about just to break it down, slow it down, and create a rhythm that was that nobody else was doing. And I think uh, I think we succeeded in doing that. It really just was wanting to make a sound that was just so overwhelming that it just ripped out your mind, your soul, and your intestines all at once. You know. I just wanted you to experience it. Freedom. It was just the, the feeling of the time and the feeling of my psyche. And, you know, it took a lot of work to get people that could relate to that, actually. I somehow started catching things on WREK. It was a show called Conceptions, a mysterious show late at night. Power for Power from Filth came on. I was in my mother's kitchen. I was making oatmeal cookies. And I had the radio on. And I was immediately attracted to it and found out that it was this band Swans and could not find their album anywhere. What really appealed to me was it sounded very tribal. The slow chords of the guitar and the drums and the sloganeering, the mantra, the repetitive, especially at the end where it's power for power, power for power, power for power. To me it had the kind of processional vibe. It was very unusual. And I could not find this album anywhere, so I drove to the station and I borrowed <laughs> the station's copy. Swans and Sonic Youth formed a really tight bond in those early days. We really started out together, we rehearsed together, we hung out a lot together. We became really good friends and we were just bombing around. We had no money, None, nobody had any money. We would spend whatever quarters we could find on playing Ms. Pac-Man in these bars, like on the Lower East Side. It really fit our brains, you know. It's like, oh, we just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. And we kind of, you know, found glory in our poverty, you know. I started a fanzine just then called Killer, and I had put Michael on the front where he's screaming in a microphone. Killer fans.
where we practiced was filled with amplifiers and guitars and all that stuff. And the front room just had like a squalid mattress in one corner and maybe a hot plate to cook on or something like that. But Mike had done these large drawings on all the walls. And they were really amazing drawings. There was creatures with huge spurting penises on the walls. It actually looked amazing. When you see a spreading penis in graffiti on a punk rock club wall, it comes across as some kind of juvenilia hokum. And I really, that's not the sense I was getting from what Michael was doing when he, he you know, I, I didn't. I, I, I thought he was actually very artful. The bunker became like this real factory of Michael Girard mind explosion. We weren't really getting much love in New York City, Sonic Youth and Swans, in the early 80s. So we decided that we needed to play somewhere besides New York City. And it was Lee's idea, Lee Ronaldo, to actually rent a van and tour. And it was Michael who said, let's call it the Savage Blunder Tour, because the idea of it was kind of, we were just blundering, you know, about. And it was, <laughs> it was savage. Lee called these clubs up and got some commitments to play. And so we had gigs. We all got into this windowless van, nothing in the back, except for our bodies, slave ship style, you know, like this. And we just took off. And we went down and we played in front of nobody, you know. I think there's some people in DC who came to see us. Nobody made any money. I mean, we were maybe able to pay for gas and a donut here and there. But we really got to figure out like what it was to sort of play for people. We played these places and some of the people who would come were like young kids who were just like, there's some hardcore bands from New York in town tonight. And they'd come and they wouldn't see hardcore. They wouldn't see the typical hardcore minor threat style band. They saw something else entirely but it was just as loud and just as hardcore as hardcore can be, but it was, it was us. We would come out generally first because following swans was not a good idea because they were so ferocious. We were both, in our own ways, pretty extreme bands. I mean, Sonic Youth was playing in all these weird tunings and doing stuff with our guitars, drumsticks, and screwdrivers under the strings that people hadn't seen before. And Swans were this incredible high volume onslaught with double bass guitar and people banging metal percussion and things. <laughs> Though we didn't really sound anything like each other, we banded together just because we needed strength, you know, and it, being together gave us strength. I was about, let's see, 22, 23. I had never seen swans. I had heard about swans, but I had never seen them. Harry Crosby approached me and he said, you should come and audition for this band I'm in, Swans. We're looking for a guitar player. Michael's instructions were you play low and then when there's a signal, you play high and just feel the music. I suppose I passed, I guess. <laughs> There was the personnel changes right from the very beginning. Sometimes they didn't work out musically, but just as often, um, I, you know, I probably drove them away because I was very dictatorial. Even though at times I didn't know what I really wanted, I just was pushing things to try to find out what it was I wanted, try to find a sound. And I didn't have a very good power of persuasion. I yelled a lot, drank a lot, and I'm sure that I was a very abrasive person. That's just who I was at the time. 
It was just this broiling mass of uh, rage, love, anger, pain, uh, fear, all of the things, you know, it was just all broiling around in me. I was at his place and he got a fan letter from Atlanta, Georgia. And the person's name was Jarbo and it was like a really interesting fan letter because it was asking kind of uh, questions about Swan's music and himself that were kind of striking as if this person who wrote this letter was really curious about this individual and it was kind of relating to this individual. The letter that I sent up there to Michael with a cassette of work that I had done and a photo, it was introducing what I was doing and what I was interested in as an artist. So it was like basically almost like a resume or like a portfolio in a very avant-garde way to show every possible accent, tonality, breathy, like really a full vocabulary of, of what the voice I could do at that time. So I put that on a tape and I sent it up there with a hand that I could have a magazine with these claw fingernails. I photocopied it. The hand was holding the tape and then there was a photo with the person I was doing the zine with. He was reading this letter to me and he's like, I don't know how to respond to this guy. It's like, it's almost like he wants to meet me or something. I feel really nervous about this letter. And I was looking at it and I was like, yeah, it's a cool letter. And I was looking at the photograph, I was like, Michael, I don't think it's this guy. I think it's the girl. I think Jarbo is the girl, not the guy. And, <laughs> and I remember Michael, like, like, all of a sudden, going like, oh, you think so? Jarbo was chosen because you don't know, is that a man or is that a woman? And that was the whole point, to be completely uh, uh, not, not uh, uh, um, representing yourself as a female or a male, just representing yourself as an artist without any expectations. And the next thing I knew, Jarbo was in town. And they were like, <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's the, you know, and she was really interesting. Michael felt an openness with me for my input just because we were friends and, you know, there was some trust there. And I think he was curious about, um, you know, evolving. He invited me to come on the tour and I flew over there in a heartbeat. It's 1984. Zurich, Switzerland. I'm outside the vocal booth where Michael is recording the vocals for the Young God EP. At the time in Swans, Michael was shouting and screaming his words. I suggested he try something new, something different. I really wanted to hear him attempt to do long, heavy, deep, kind of from the, from the deep in the chest notes instead of just the, the shouting and the talking and the, and, and the, and the screaming, do more, more like vocalizing from a singing point of view. Then I had suggested during a break, you know, just through the door, just try that. He actually did it, and it was so exciting, you know, to hear him do the long descending note. And it's in evidence when I crawled. And this was really, I think, a major move forward, in my opinion, for his vocal style and for the way he would approach music. Right. 
juggle taught me to sing from your stomach. It was hard for me to grasp how to sing from down here rather than from here. I would constantly lose my voice because I'm singing from here. But if you push the air up and out without uh, uh, occluding it with your vocal cords or tightening your throat, you're less likely to lose your voice, you know. And you'll have more bellowing power, which of course I wanted. And at the same time, Michael and I were developing feelings for each other and developing a relationship that was very, very intense. The show at the Loft in Berlin, he took his entire earnings of that show and he bought me roses from a street vendor in Berlin. And this is kind of a powerful moment for us in terms of our communication and bonding, you know? That's the front room, and over here is the uh, bar and I was actually working at the bar. Actually, I took them there, and, uh, and uh, I was working at the bar, yes, and he got pissed drunk, yeah. I know that I was very, very impressed with the shows that they played in Berlin with Oli Mosiman as a drummer. This ultra, ultra slow and loud period, I uh, uh, liked that very much. I wanted to be part of Swans. I was unstoppable force. I saw the future of Swans. I saw I saw the power of Swans. I mean, I really, I really believed in Swans, and I believed in Michael, because they were doing something that nobody else was doing, in my opinion, then. Rub Collins had started a satellite label of um, some bizarre called K422. And it was Jim that gave us a cassette of the Swans album, Cop. Swans recorded Cop pretty soon after I had met them. I uh, was friendly with Rob and I said, you've got to listen to this. And Jim said, you should work with this band, they're just incredible live. This is going to blow your head off. The offer was made, yes, you know, we want to put out your record, we want to record you. And I remember walking um, to the streets of London after that meeting, and Michael was just like on cloud nine. He just had this big smile on his face. He was almost like dancing on the sidewalk. He was so happy. Because this was a huge, huge moment, you know. I don't exist. We hadn't heard anything like it, really. It was. Uh kind of just really exciting. Michael is a person I feel that's such an incredible early life filled with a lot of intense experience and intense emotion that if he had had any musical training, it might have gotten in the way of him accessing those emotions and releasing those into his music. And so, in a way, when you listen to Swans, you're getting a undistilled pipeline back to Michael's psyche that is really, really very much his own. Just so I know it's From a young age, I felt completely separate from other people. Like, I didn't really have a uh, relationship to society in any clear way. I felt self-sufficient and also kind of uh, abandoned and on my own in the world. And it was my uh, 
place to claw my way out of it. My mother, she was a tragic alcoholic and didn't really uh, raise me in any way. I was a pretty messed up kid. I was in a lot of trouble all the time with the police. I was arrested constantly for breaking into houses and uh, vandalism and taking drugs. I started taking a lot of drugs at a very early age. When I was 13, I had a big baggie full of secondol on me, and I was just falling over and stumbling. Someone called the police, and they came and they arrested me with all those drugs. And that's when the police laid down a condition to my mother that I could no longer live with her or else I was going to go to juvenile hall until, it, to, until I was 18. So my father, who was then living in Germany, he came out and got me. So then we moved to Europe. He took me to Paris first with him, and I ran away from there, just feeling the call of the wild of the times. I met a bunch of pretty scraggly hippies, and I went with them. Wildness was in the air, and I just left, you know? I didn't have any sense of who I was or what I was doing. We hitchhiked to Amsterdam. Panhandling barefoot on the streets and living in squats and the whole thing. And the police came in and arrested us all. And I spent a couple weeks in jail in Amsterdam. After having been to some of these rock festivals where I saw some really great music on LSD, I saw Amon Duel, I saw the Art Ensemble of Chicago, I saw Frank Zappa, I saw Soft Machine, I saw early Pink Floyd around the Umaguma time. Careful with it, Axie Zine was the first time I heard someone scream in the I remember seeing them perform that, and it was just because it's such a slow, tense build, and then that scream is yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yes, there. definitely an influence, yeah. you know. Not stylistically, mm -hmm. but just in terms of the dynamics. turns out that the police contacted my father because he, of course, had Interpol looking for me. And then we had a meeting, my father and I, I suppose, and the deal was that I was going to either work in this factory in Solingen, Germany, and I, I guess he figured that would show me what's what, you know, or I would go to this uh, Swiss boarding school. And so I chose the factory, of course, because he thought I'd last a month or a week or something. To me, the Swiss school just seemed like prison camp. So the next day, these older hippies and I, and we decided to go to Israel. So we hitchhiked from Solingen down through Germany and through Yugoslavia and then through into Greece and then went from Greece over to Turkey and stayed in Istanbul. Pretty penniless. We left Istanbul and we went to a kibbutz in Israel and they had procured a bunch of hashish and then hitchhiked down to Jerusalem and ended up in a hostel in Jerusalem. And I was attempting to sell it there. And the police walked in with the Uzis and uh, I was arrested. I ended up staying like a month and a half in the jail in Jerusalem. And then I subsisted in Jerusalem by panhandling and then I sold my blood. I went to trial and I was given an additional month. It was supposed to be a juvenile prison, but I was sent to an adult prison. It was horrible and it was something that a young boy shouldn't have experienced. In prison, I realized the most important thing was time because anybody that's been in jail knows that time crawls and uh, there's virtually nothing to do. Um, I did read a great deal for the first time in my life and that probably helped me a lot. Do you think that had any bearing on the rest of your life? And maybe also a sense of urgency? Yeah, sure. I was like a panic to, to get shit done, you know, to make sure that I actually did something. And I, I still have that to a certain extent. I mean, I think we all should. It was the Dalai Lama that said that if death was staring you in the face at every second, you'd be in the correct consciousness. My father must have been out of his mind with worry. And that's the, uh, the kind of solipsism of youth. 
Once he found me, my father sent me back to Southern California. I thought I was an artist and I had found my calling. I was drawing constantly. I was kind of obsessed with Robert Crumb and uh, read somewhere that he recommended drawing 50 drawings a day. So I had notebooks and I would just draw constantly, do like 50 drawings a day. And I got pretty good at drawing. This must have been 77 or something. All these bands played just around the corner from Otis at some kind of Masonic hall. And since I had been listening to Honk on the radio, I was really interested in um, That concert was just so shambolic and so violent in a fun way <laughs> that it just, it made, it just clicked with me. I had seen Suicide play in Los Angeles and they played at a tiny little place with no stage at all. So the audience was at the same level as them performing. And they were typical L.A. audience, pretty close-minded and couldn't deal with suicide. And so they were spitting right in his face as, as he was performing. And, and he'd just go, oh, oh, and he'd put it in his mouth and say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Hit himself with the microphone and then continue. And to me, that was just utterly inspirational. Punk just seemed to be saying all the right things, which was, it kind of embraced swallowed up consumer culture and then spit it back out at you in a kind of mangled form. I remember Michael thinking at some point something was going to happen to bands like us. I saw Swans, February 86, at Yulu, and reviewed that gig. And that was it for me, that was it. I don't mean to speak in cliches, but I didn't actually have words to describe it, except when I had to put it down on paper. And to this day, I still don't have proper words to describe what happened that night. thing I'd ever heard. It, it, it was louder than Neubaut, and Neubaut were pretty loud. Swans were not into protecting your hair, and, you know, so there you go. <laughs> really went way past music. Michael and Swans at that time were interested in finding out what sound did, just raw sound, seeing what it does. Almost like a, like a gun at somebody's head and see what happens. transcendental experience when you were hearing it. There weren't many people who wanted to review a Swans record or go to a Swans gig and review it. There were hardly any. You know, this, uh, you could sit down and try and persuade people. They'd just be, no, you know, you're off, you're, you're off your nut. Shit! 
If you read the music papers, you had to go into very specific specialist shops to be able to actually get a copy of those records. thought about art a great deal, I realized that iconic images were very important towards conveying a message. But the message to me was important that it be blunt, but also obtuse and hard to parse. I had a great affinity for writers that wrote in very cold language about horrific events. And I kind of liked that idea of having this blunt language, but it didn't really mean what it said. And that's kind of how advertising is as well. You'll have these bold statements, and then there's always this tremendous amount of subtext that are designed to send tendrils into your uh, consciousness and lure you into their world. So all that kind of went into the use of that iconography in those images. He would always say these really primal things like, um, I love you, walk away. Walk away. Jabo was playing keyboards and doing backing vocals and wearing some sort of see-through schmuck, and it was something else. And people didn't know what to make of it. People did not know what to make of it. But Jabba was brilliant. secret weapon and attack dog, both expressions Michael would use in interviews about me. And what it meant to me was the unexpected element. I remember the first time I opened a show singing, I was alone on the stage singing to a loop on my keyboard. It was like being a sacrifice, like a sacrificial lamb, and I actually kind of enjoyed that because it was a way of reflecting how strong I could be. And so it would be go out there cold, alone, and open the show. I'd be kneeling on my knees, you know, singing blackmail. To go out there in front of an audience, primarily male, that has come to be bludgeoned with loud, heavy, percussive music is uh, a very extreme place to be. Here you are, you're offering yourself, you're completely vulnerable to them. So coming out alone, woman, and singing to them, it's like they're being set up for what comes later. And I think in the case of those days, before I developed my own audience in the band, it made them angry. So I had things thrown at me, uh, yelling, spitting, um, every insult you could possibly hurl. Show us your tits was one of them. And I didn't miss a note, because the attitude was like, you're not gonna even phase me. I'm not gonna even react. <laughs> Now, Al reacted to it in England one time, and I heard these cowboy boots come stomping out, and he came up to the edge and started screaming at him. Shut the fuck up, shut up. And of course, I still continued to sing unfazed, you know, <laughs> unfazed by Al or by the audience. At 
as a performer, you get really strong when you go through stuff like that. Jumbo was a good foil for working alongside his intensity. I think she offered some more subtleties. You know, between them, there was uh, some light and shade. Uh oh, we gotta go. This is American Top 40. My name's Casey Kasem, and I count down to the number one song in the land continues. Number 20. Here's a song that is number one in five countries, including the US. Who's that girl? God was just like the boat from the blue because you you don't know what to expect what's coming next after you know what had gone before you don't know what to expect Whoa. ones had done up till then was very specific and then they started branching out and they thought they could bring their ideas which some people would say were extreme into the mainstream sure, sure. How different Swan's music was compared to everything else going on at that time. There was times I got off stage in those days. For sure, I knew at that time, on that day, we were the best band in the world. For sure. Children of God kind of grew organically out of being obsessed with the money thing, and it, I was just thinking about religion and sex actually as being one more kind of way of subsuming yourself in, in a, an entity or ideas outside yourself. Sex being the way that it's perceived in the media and things, you know. I just started writing with that theme in mind. He's coming again! He's coming again! I remember seeing Jimmy Swagger, who was a great uh, rock performer actually. <laughs> But it was Jesus that hung upon the bloody hill of And just being amazed at that and um, seeing the power in that and wanting to kind of access that idea with the notion of God and religion. He should box, but it is a gift of God. I was just accessing that language because it seemed right. Without really moralizing about it. Get in it! and serve God and worship Jesus with all of your heart. I'm not making a comparison to Bowie, but I think Michael's got this ability to reinvent, change direction. He's not afraid to mix it up. He's not afraid to sort of confront his fans with something completely different and if they don't want to go on his journey that's fine gradually i started to suffer under the illusion that i could actually sing songs and i started to write songs on acoustic guitar which were uh, tentative affairs at best at the beginning but i eventually taught myself how to do it fairly well i think In a I 
remember having a conversation with Michael before they made Children of God and he was telling me that he wanted to bring in acoustic guitars and have more of a song-based structure to that record. And I was a bit shocked because I, I was just like, no, I just keep it loud, just, just keep the volume and the intensity. Nothing inside you is real. Nothing inside Hopefully people uh, were able to get something real out of it. Consistently trying to break through things and get to a place that had a light in it. I was never that loud just for yayas, you know, it wasn't like this macho idea of anything. For certain things you need certain volume and then stuff happens. There's this thing called opalescence, which is sort of a phase transition, you know, that happens and sort of gives off this little bright light, that's why they call it opalescence. So that's what would happen with the sound, at a certain volume there's this phase transition with the sound where it becomes almost liquid. The sound starts to dance, it becomes this other thing, it's a beautiful thing to see. And that's what we were trying to do. I remember on stage, the, it was really a good feeling, a good atmosphere. The sound was so good because it was where it's supposed to be. We went over the curfew, and so they pulled the plug on everything but the vocal mic. So all the instruments were dead. And so we just walked off stage, and Michael continued to shout and scream through the microphone alone on the stage. So I don't think that was particularly polite, that they just Cut you off. I remember him coming into the dressing room at the end, just furious. And then the press in England didn't help by saying that I never saw happen, that people were throwing up because of the volume and all this business. I mean, you know, it kind of got this reputation that the, the reputation preceded, you know, the name when it was just known for nothing but bludgeon loudness. And that was not, that was not the idea. <laughs> Do you find that there's a chance that you may break through now and get some attention because you've been around eight years and still swans are only contained within their group? Well, I think that's natural because uh, what we did for so long it wasn't exactly uh, mass market potential. Although I was reminded by a friend of mine just recently that I always, never could understand why it wasn't on the charts, but considering what it was, I don't think that was a very realistic um, outlook. I was seduced by the potential to actually make a decent living at music and acceded to these things. I know that I didn't want to live in a dark dungeon on 6th Street and Avenue B anymore. But I think our aesthetics were not necessarily correct for each other and so something less than stellar resulted. Place of no pain, the angels would throw down the water they cried from. You know, God forbid a band changes the sound. As a person, you change. You can't become a, a copy of yourself, a caricature of what you're supposed to be. As a human being, you change. Your music changes. Your ideas change. <laughs> I thought it 
it was working out. But it seemed that that record went so far afield from my core or who I am as a person. And what I would have seen was that as a transition was these song-based things was really cinematic and interesting orchestrations. And instead it turned out these kind of discrete orchestrations that were not expansive, you know, and I lost control of it and it didn't, but it's my fault that I lost control. It lost its center. And she holds me The gloss of Burning World to me was the issue. And she smiled This was a terrible, terrible misstep. The songs themselves are fantastic. The songs themselves are amazing. But still, we weren't allowed into the mix, you know. We weren't even allowed into the studio. It was just too artificial an experience. I think it was just a, kind of a shock for the fans. In terms of the whole machinations of that monster, it was not a positive experience. When I think about the burning world, I think it was an adventure sideways for swans. So I look at it as a just a very specific record unto itself. I was happy that I signed swans then. I was thrilled, and I'm still thrilled that I have that one document that is unlike any other Swans record. When, when we were young, we had no history. It has some good songs on it. It has the song Goddamn the Sun on it, which is uh, one of the best, lyrically, uh, one of the best songs I've ever written. Good shoes. The classic Swans aesthetic is there, God damn the sun, right? Like if you think of God damn the sun, that lyric, I mean, that says all about the swan's aesthetic, which is a sort of very personal, existential looking inside. It's disconnected fr from the universe, even God damn the sun that gives us all life. God damn the sun. When one signs to a major label, your expectations is that your record does really well and it sells in hopefully the six figures. But sometimes that just doesn't happen. It's about timing. Uh, and I think the timing of Uni Records was off. The damage from that, just psychologically, uh, to me, uh, there was a loss of confidence. It always seemed to me that swans were waiting to be accepted. You know, it had nothing to do with the, the sort of material they were putting out, because like Burning World was a very accessible record. But it seemed like it was Sonic Youth that were getting more attention. After the burning world was finished, I was left penniless as usual um, at the end of the whole affair and I uh, had to claw my way back out. Somehow I stood up again and put things together and moved forward. But any number of great musicians have made really crummy music. I've certainly made my share of crummy music with some high points along the way, but that was just a failed avenue, like a dead end, and um, I found threads in the burning world to continue that were fruitful to develop in the next record, which is pretty much how I always keep going. There's, there's something in there that's worth uh, taking and moving forward with and discard the rest and then move forward with that thread. But I took control of the production, and I was listening to lots of Ennio Morricone then, at the time, and Phil Spector. And um, I really uh, wanted to kind of try my hand at that sort of uber grandiose production. M.O. 
core basis of swans was the idea of have a sense of urgency and persistence. You know, keep going. There's that quote about the talent, you know, talent is everywhere. The world will never hear from them, the world will never see it, because they don't leave the comfort zone and just be persistent and keep going, keep going, keep sense of urgency. I like the way that white line from the Mount of Infinity was recorded. It's got a sort of a majestic precision. I met Kurt Cobain while I was in Atlanta, and he was a big Swans fan. And he was like, oh, Swans, I love Swans. You know, I gave him my only cassette of uh, White Light from the Mouth of Infinity because it had just come out. It's interesting from the recording process on the White Light era, he was really working on making accessible music. He was still thinking, you know, commercial music. It was funny because the music he was making was far from it. White Light had the intensity of the early music, but it had more musicality. I wouldn't have accrued the knowledge necessary to make White Light without having completely fucked up on Burning World. So in a way, failure is very good because that's how you learn. Of the punishing burden of failure. I don't deserve to be down here, but I'll never leave. And I... I write to create a mental experience. I did not sit down and say, well, I failed at MCA, now I'm going to write a song of failure. It's like that was within my vocabulary as a human, thinking about failure work. And really, that song, I, I think I wrote that in, in like an hour. It just... It just came. I've learned nothing. I can't even elegantly bleed out the poison blood of failure. I had this little kind of rudimentary blues riff, and I just wrote the words, and they came. I was trying to steer him more into this Americana potential that he had, you know, uh, he didn't really have the confidence in his own voice as, say, like a country singer. Man, you have the potential to be like a, you know, like a Ray Price or something, you know? <laughs> when I was 15 years old, my boyfriend gave me my first Swans tape, and like, there was swans and I didn't love heavy music but when I heard love of life I was like oh my god I get it it's not it's not only you know heavy aggressive music it's it's also inviting and melodic and it's like this ocean of uh, sound and and words and all of a sudden, I could understand wanting to listen to really loud music. <laughs> and I remember thinking, like, the burning world and filth and love of life, like, sounds like three totally different bands. Like, what's the deal here? To me, you know, in my ears, those are beautiful, melodic, dense and melody orchestrated albums, almost symphonic. They're so orchestrated. Those albums have depth to them that are new. You'd be hard pressed to find a band that occupies such a vastly different sonic identity uh, over that period of time, uh, but still remains very, very much kind of in and of itself.
Dreamland is the record that actually really sticks with me. I remember listening to You See Through Me, listening to that recording about his alcoholism. I couldn't believe that this frightening figure like Michael is willing to make himself that vulnerable. The alcohol was getting out of control. I got to be somewhat uh, uh, infamous there in the, in the neighborhood because I would, I would get so disgusted, I'd head out the door and I'd hit every spot. So I'd go into the bar looking for him, you know, to try to get him to come home. Sometimes he'd come home at dawn. So it was, that was a big problem all the time. Explain to me. No, that's, that's how it is. You're going to support me. So. What does that have to do with your drinking too much? No. Now, why are you bringing it up? Because my problem is that you're drinking too much. That was just an example of me recording because I wanted to show him later, you know, what he was like. I worry about you having an alcohol problem. I drank a great deal. I drank every day for 30 years, and I drank copious amounts towards the end. So the fact that I worry about your drinking too much is not a good thing, huh? I shouldn't no. care about no. you. No. Fuck you, it's your fault. That you... Money. Why do you drink too much? No, no. Fuck you, shut your mouth, get some money, we have to live. It's your problem, not mine. Okay. He is being shown in a very unflattering light. It's not like opening up your heart. It's like dropping your pants and taking a shit in the room. It's just like, oh my God, what's that? What's wrong with you? You know, it's, it's kind of, that's the thing. He's, he's standing up and saying, I'm kind of a shitty person. I don't know anyone else who has the nerve to do that. Hey, $100,000 a year. Are you still going to go drinking at the bar every night? Let's say this. You don't make anything, but you don't. You make I just happened to be a human. I'm sorry. And I just used that recording because it was an uh, interesting moment of humanity. And then I captioned it with the phrase, you see through me, as a uh, honor to Jarbo that this whole thing was placed there having shown me what I was like. Not that, of course, I paid any attention to it. Can you pay my mother the $46 that you spent on her telephone? Yeah. And by the way, when you were down there, yeah. I took really good care of you. I worked really hard that taking good work. care of you. That was that I don't think you can put a price on it. Okay, $200, right? Do you love me at all, Michael? Yeah. You see through me. I had a call from the studio. My mother was not doing well, and I was taking care of her. And I had to go at a moment's notice to drive to do this vocal, and then drive back super fast because of her. And um, my dad had a small amount of really old whiskey in the cedar chest. So I grabbed that bottle, and I drove really fast to where the studio was, and tore up the steps. And it's literally slide in there, press record, and I open that bottle. I just shot the whole thing back to find that performer. And he left that in there. The, the, the rah, that stuff was nasty. That is me reacting to that. You know, I had to like immediately go into character, do that ferocious vocal. Turn our feet in your eyes. Turn our trails in. Soundtracks for the Blind was the last Swans record. Kind of a summing up and an expulsion of all the ideas that had happened previously. Mm -hmm. 
what is the main reason why you're burying swans now, at this stage? Well, I've worked on it for 15 years, and um, it's never really given me any rewards other than the music. I still want to make music, but I just think that the name Swans itself, after having been around so long, in many journalists' mind or in the public or even in my own mind, maybe it makes preconceptions that might limit it. To me, it's best to just set it aside and go on to other things. The whole history of it, the aesthetic approach of it, the perception of it in the public, everything was a straitjacket at that point to me. And um, I just thought it was time to end it. It just couldn't, it couldn't go any further. I just thought as an artist it was time to kill it. So I did. And simultaneously, I guess, Jarbo and my relationship was deteriorating. And uh, I just felt it was time to just cut the rope. People would assume because you broke up as a couple, the band ended, and I would say, no, the opposite happened. It was the death of Swans that ended the relationship because to me, Swans was our child, and I loved the group tremendously. I mean, I moved heaven and earth and left my entire life of people that love me to go live under those conditions and to do, go on those tours. Now that was announced to me, I was not asked my opinion about it. And because of that, I had an internal rage. Soundtracks for the Blind, where you get that incredible exploration of soundscapes. To me, it was always a natural progression that that work would happen. Um, it always, to me, it, it, it felt very much like it fit. There's an aesthetic principle behind it all. It is It's kind of Michael experimenting with different ways of delivering the message and playing with different sort of musical approaches. You I started to think about the music as soundtracks and I started to look at it as always emerging or evolving environments that may or may not have some words in them. My inspiration was to make soundtracks but not have a film. That's what every record from White Light on has been. When it comes to the production, it's really about making a soundtrack, you know, a one big experience. It's more about making a sonic environment for people to live in for an hour or two. Today, I do not have a fever. I feel about the same as I did yesterday. The personal aspect of that album were the recordings made with our family members, with my mom and with his dad, who was going blind. Uh, I'm what they call uh, legally blind. Our parents were dying uh, or near death or losing their wits and uh, made uh, a little homage to them. You know, making it, putting it together and getting all the source material and it was a very, uh, almost like a um, I don't want to say diary, but a slice of life of, of, you know, what was really going on on a deep personal level. They tried to see it together and couldn't and told me I'd lose my eyesight. But that, you know, it, it, oh, oh. I just looked at all the material as being of potentially equal importance. I had tons, I had trunks of floppy disks of uh, samples I had made over the years and um, those were all fodder. Everything was available to use to make this sonic uh, picture.
influence of swans across so many different genres and so many different bands and they don't get the props for it. Often in music there's no first prize. You don't get the prize for being the first person to do a particular thing or among the first people to do a particular thing. I think that was the right thing to do in his life at that time. It was, took a lot of guts to shut that thing down, to shut swans down at his age at that point. sense to me after so many years of struggle when I saw things getting better. Everything was getting bigger. The size of the audience, the choice of venue, just everything was getting, in my opinion, so much better. What do you think of swans so far? Oh, they're beautiful. Uh, did you know that this is the last swan show here? That's what I've been told. It's a damn shame. It's kind of sad to see him go. Like, nuts. But everything has to end. It's been a long time. It's only been like 15 years. It's not for anybody. Oh, we're gonna, I'm going to miss the music. But uh, thankfully I have to keep and listen to for as long as, uh, as long as the CDs last. It seemed that the relationship was dissolving every night in one way or another, not necessarily on stage, but around the stage during the traveling portion of sound checks. It was a very fraught relationship. I liken it to being like stuck in a weird kind of postmodern version of who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, you know? Just being there, you felt like you were kind of like a willing participant in this psychodrama that was happening so it was a lot to be in that band at that time when the two of them were kind of going slowly in their separate ways <laughs> In the life of a performer, there are these moments that are magical and transcendent. When you're so immersed in that moment and so at one that you know that you are experiencing something that you will remember for the rest of your life. The I Crawl performance is one of those moments. That was a whole, in my mind, a whole theater piece of multiple characters to let those come to life from almost like a seductive, breathy voice. You're my father. I obey you. Into a lost little girl. <laughs> I 
and down hard with the beast. A very, very low sub voice, which is a growly, uh, deep, ferocious tonality. And I was completely going into that role. And I was really in a trance-like state where I rolled my eyes into the back of my head. I had no idea I was doing that. No! looked forward to that brutal growl at the end. I, f I felt very powerful doing that. <laughs> I knew that I could go as far with that baby as I wanted. I mean, I gave it everything I had, you know, because I knew at that point there was nothing that could stop me. was an homage to Michael referencing his voice on that song and going into the sub voice deep, deep down in my chest. This was my way of showing love to the band that I, uh, I loved. poignant beyond description to be playing to these, for us, huge audiences around the world. But it was the last, it was the end. And we knew it was ending. And for me, it was, I cried on stage a couple times. It was just a bitter moment, bitter and sweet, of course. Yeah, it was the end, and I didn't really know what the hell was gonna happen next. last performance, the swan stayed at the Astoria. There was this extraordinary moment at the end of the concert when he actually came out onto the stage and he was completely naked. And it was to be a goodbye in a sense, but a very powerful one at that. I thank you for your kind attention and we leave you now forever, goodbye. I thought of Swans as a failure. I thought I'd failed.
But general attrition with the divorce. <laughs> that to spam. Faces and blackened eyes Break open your glass doors Welcome the whirling debris Carve your name there In the marble and concrete Kill idiot violence Punish greed Michael on the Young God side blogs that he's just been listening to this demo by Devinder Banhart. That was the first time I think my name would have been on the internet, you know. I mean, I thought like, Fuck, I made it. This is crazy. Uh, he wrote me a letter and uh, he just said, hey, do you want to um, put out this record to change my life? I was like so into Angels of Light and I was so into Michael as a writer and so into, at that point, already loving swans. So the hatred from my mouth the songs would be based on the lyrics and the basic acoustic guitar performance. And that was a huge challenge to me, which made it interesting, was for me, coming from the history of Swans, that was a huge challenge. So I pushed that. The credo or the agenda was always that the song had to be good, just played by me on acoustic guitar and singing. It had to be good that way. It didn't, it, it should not require anything else besides that to be convincing and hopefully powerful. So that's where it started, and then I orchestrated on, on top of that. <laughs> Angels of Light, unfortunately, was a failure in terms of reaching a large amount of people. I'm still like totally flummoxed that I'm here breathing or that this moment right now just passed and it's going on and where is it? Where am I right now? It's like the big question is always like, do I really exist? He never wanted to be a romantic hero or be worshipped. This is going into the whole punk attitude, refuse to be put on a pedestal, refuse to be a star. Michael called me in the end of 2008, one day out of the blue, and was just like, hey, Todd, I'm writing songs, and they're kind of angry. I haven't written any angry songs like this in a long time, and I'm actually thinking about calling it Swans again. I guess I viewed it as a last gasp, a last chance to do this, and I wanted it to be as forward-thinking and as challenging to both myself and the audience as possible, and to lead us to a place we didn't expect to go musically at that moment, but try to do it in a way that is in the moment and not nostalgic, for God's sake. I think Swans needed to come back. They had um, unfinished business. Michael staked absolutely everything on a fresh roll of the dice on a complete creative gamble. But for someone who's had a lot of disappointments, I was fully prepared to tank and to fail completely. And so because I was prepared for that, the potential for catastrophe did not have as much weight. So when it started to become successful, I had no expectations for that. But when it started to become successful, it was wonderful. And I just appreciate it and don't uh, count on that ever at all. I think Michael has done something which very, very few artists do, which is that he has continued to stay true to himself. It's 
the spiritual journey from the early 1980s to now. It's a pure sound. And the purity of what he's doing is just like really, you know, I don't know whether it's healing or what it is, but it is just, it, you know, there's something there that's not available anywhere else. It's mine. When I saw Swans play for the first time, it was at the Bowery Ballroom. And, and I'll never forget it because, you know, usually before a band starts, there's this sort of pre-show mixtape that they have playing or something like this that people are just kind of mingling to. But Swans, like, you know, they just had a tone playing. It was just this really loud tone. And so instead of being able to just sort of like talk over it and mingle with whoever you're next to, you just were immediately slightly brainwashed. And just by like playing that tone, they took that venue and they made it theirs like immediately. And so everybody's just blissed out on this tone and everybody's like, yes, this is Swans. I'll never forget it, so yeah. I just thought that before I died, I wanted to experience the kind of uh, Maelstrom was a swirling tornado of sound again. I wanted to be inside that sound again. I remember seeing the Swan Show at Alexander Palace, and I remember thinking after that, that's it, I'm going home. I've seen I've seen what I need to see. When I listen to swans, especially when I see them live, I feel like I'm seeing the whole history of music being replayed in front of me. It's not about what they're playing, it's just it's the feeling I have. Alexandra Palace, Jira kind of looked like he was in a trance or something, he was kind of started crying like a, like a baby. And at first, people were kind of sniggering. There was no music, and it was becoming really uncomfortable. And then you noticed that people had stopped laughing and they weren't smiling they were just like what is he doing and suddenly this kind of cry developed into just like this scream ah! like this human scream of agony ah! 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 and then just the song kicked in <laughs> It was so bizarre and so moving, you know. I've never seen a band do anything like that before. to me. I like the fact of music being a struggle, being a physical commitment to make it happen. Trying to figure out how to make something uh, undeniable happen just through your own physical energy. To me, it just being there and just expelling sweat and just feeling your body torn down as the music's happening is kind of like a penitential, and um, that feels right. It's basically music that you 
You want to play, you want to write, but you never dare do. Because in order to achieve that, you need to have, um, you know, lived beyond consensus, live beyond expectations. You're absolutely mature and you are ready to express yourself with no compromise. I had no idea swans would have this kind of legs. I mean, I felt back in the day that we were doing something bright, you know, making a stand. But I felt it was important. Michael's not a normal person. I mean, to have that kind of drive, you're not a normal person. I still love the oxygen! had zero tolerance for anything that will get in the way of him being able to do this. Michael's always whipping the sound into a fury and into an ecstatic release um, of which, as an audience member, I had to surrender to or it would have been too intense and probably driven me out, you know? That music is not for the weak. surrendering to the sound because it's just it's like why fight it you can't fight it you know just like just surrender instead becomes like a vortex that just sucks you in and it doesn't let you go until the music stops. You become an animal that consists of all of us. You could call it a beast. during a swan show that you're wrapped up in that ecstasy and the stage becomes hallowed ground for a very brief moment it becomes a spiritual ceremony it's Michael shocking us into presence and I've seen him go into these trance like states where he's punching himself and slapping himself and hitting himself and he's doing that to shake himself out of himself he's doing that to get out of the way that initial maybe very male and aggressive and some of the brutality of swans there's something very very sensitive very very beautiful and very very feminine and Michael always making a play for transcendence reaching for divinity reaching for for peace it's I think it really is Michael reaching for peace and you can see it in the live shows that's where the kind of shamanic quality of his performing comes into play. He's trying to claw his way into heaven. It's like self-emoliation. He's trying to light himself on fire to just be free of the bondage of this sack of fucking flesh. It's a beautiful thing to see.
I've thought about why that volume two and a half hour bludgeoning is so cathartic for people. Um, and that, I think, gets into the realm of like neuroscience that I am not qualified to really speak about. It's a minimalist symphony orchestra that happens to use amplified instruments and goes to 132 dB. That volume is part of what allows what we do to transcend just music. Michael wants to build the mountain as big as he can make it. It's not a wall of sound, it's a mountain of sound. It's a mountain range. It's like Mount Everest of sound. Swans, they are so massive, but also minimalistic in the way they compose music, using the same chords over, over and over and over again. Uh, but it always grows into something unpredicted and unknown. And the sound keeps changing all the time, so you have to be very present and you have to get into this meditative state of mind and just be absorbed. Much of the material does not have a time structure or a rhythm even is that it's necessary for me to conduct the waves of sound. So I've discovered that if I use my arms and my body, it's almost like I'm playing an instrument, but it's five other people. I can move it like a classical music conductor would, move the dynamics of the sound with my body. Those are things I do naturally because the music kind of forces me to do those things, and so I do them. But to me, yeah, it's all about just atomizing and having the music just completely erase you for a brief moment of ecstasy. <laughs> they demand so much of an audience. They demand a complete submission. Michael, as a performer, really forces everybody in the room into a eviscerated space where time and space itself becomes so irrelevant to the experience. Michael has suffered trauma when he was younger, physical, spiritual, psychological, and I think if you look at the arc that his songwriting and music making career has taken, it goes through various stages, almost like the stages of grief, but I would say these are like the stages of existentialism. It's, um, you, you start off with trauma can induce this idea that life is random, it is violent, it has no purpose, and often horrific things happen to people who are innocent or have done nothing wrong. And it can take a lifetime to reconcile yourself to this fact. And I think you can trace almost like a history, a time scale of how you deal with existential trauma over the case of a lifetime. And now what I think you've got in the autumn of their career is something that's closer almost to kind of like Zen Buddhism you've got like an acceptance of like, yeah, life is random, it is violent, and terrible things can happen to people who don't deserve it. But also, 
an acceptance of this fact and an ability to celebrate it. At the core of it now is a celebration of life, I think, and the possibility of love, where you'd be hard pressed to find that in Swans early music though, I think, you know. Michael's creating a world that takes you outside of yourself. You're transcending yourself and your body and the music takes on a dimension. And I don't think it's any accident that it has that dimension. With the volume, with adding that dimension, feel hitting you so loud you actually feel that resonating through your body the music is so physical so so circular you, you fall into it you know it's not there it's all around you and you're kind of falling into it definitely that's that's the very heart of it something that's strong and has truth in it and I'm seeing an audience actually receive that sonic truth to quote Thurston seeing it going into their psyches and having them really feel the kind of uh, joy that we experience while we're playing it is so incredibly rewarding oh, yeah. just kind of elevates and becomes something much bigger than us and everyone. And that's the reward also, you know, just being inside that and having a sense of um, urgency of existence, you know, and, and how magical and strange it is. That's what I live for. interested in the pursuit of the divine. The songs themselves become mantras or prayers. For some reason, the sound has led me to be a more contemplative, even spiritual kind of person. Something about the sound and the, the kind of uh, transcendent quality that it can achieve. To become to be kind, to be kind, to be That's the music, it just moves along and finds new ground as it goes. And that's how it's developed. But it's just allowing yourself to be enveloped by the sound and just letting the sound push you forward. Not scared, Charles. My children need this to be a good record. It's on you. My children's welfare is on you. Change. 
with the same tuning so at the beginning. So Michael is not really a musician in the way that I think about a musician, he's like a curator of noise or sound or something. The music is the sound of the id. This is what Swans is all about to me. It's something um, that can't be attained in words, is what he's looking for. And that's, therein lies the challenge. Um, it's a feeling. And the only way to understand that feeling is to try to get inside of his head. But that, to me, is exactly what makes Swans work, is he surrounds himself with these intellectual musicians that he beats to a bloody pulp. Michael is not a fearless human, but he is a fearless artist. Michael is more of like a big picture visionary with just a strange world view that comes across in everything that is swans. sitting on my typewriter in my rehearsal space in 1982 and Sonic Youth asked me if they could use them and I said yeah. sure. That's called World Looks Red. It was a popular song. Oh, okay, yeah. It's on yeah. Confusion is Sex, I think. Oh, wow. And uh, I haven't looked at them or thought about them in years, but I was playing this uh, song that we're going to use them on. And I thought, geez, I'll just use those words. start with you coming in before I sing, doing what you just ended with. Mm -hmm. It needs something else. It just sounds, again, like samba, and I'm this close to just ditching it. I'm playing the, naturally I would play the G in the break there. My part is in between. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Ba -ba -ba -ba. And then some Norman, I think you did, when we played it yesterday, I, I believe that you did that strumming like that a little more often. I, th I think that added a lot of tension, which I like. Yeah, that's the part I liked. Uh, so let's try to see if we can get in the zone, otherwise we're just going to ditch this song.
challenges. It's hard to understand him sometimes, you know. I guess the hardest part is really like just the communication misunderstandings and the, the little details and the nuances that make it difficult to communicate such weird concepts. You know, the, he just says conceptually what he wants you to do and it can be difficult. And he can get frustrated and everybody can get frustrated in the process. <laughs> That's your lowest E? That's my, what do you mean by lo lower? I start lower. On this final E? That's my higher E. You start lower on the final E. Uh, you said you the do, opposite. you do. But you said the opposite yesterday. No, because it needs to go somewhere. Start lower. Ready? I, wait, Ready? Well, One. I, I need to understand. I need to understand. That's what you did. I'm just confused. Just explain. Go it. down the neck. You Play mean? your lowest E. Okay, that's where your chord was. Somewhere like that, and you had a chord down there. And then the, you do that for a bit, and then you go up higher because we're staying on this chord That's now. That's right. I went to the high chord. Though. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. No, oh. fine. It's fine. Whatever you want. Fine. I'm not arguing with you. Do what you want. This is okay, let's do it without him. Ready? No. No. We got to get this straightened out. What? What am I supposed to say? That's the case. Um, I think uh, I heard. No. What I want is what we did yesterday. There's confusion. I'm not understanding what you mean. I just said what I mean. Yeah, but I don't understand it. I just need you to you take go an octave lower. Down. I get caught up in the heat of the moment, and it's like almost like yelling, you know, arguing with family members. Michael doesn't compromise with us as the band, too. He doesn't let things pass. If there's something that bothers him, he voices it, and it gets fixed because we're all adults here, we'll fix it. Best yet. I don't want you to ever lose that feel. That's totally fucking righteous. It sounds sonically great, too. Michael sometimes has a reputation as being very difficult. Oh, he's very difficult. Uh, but, you know, this is, I learned this through working with Nick Cave or the Crabs or Jeffrey Lee Paris. All of these people I've worked with, and Michael is one person I've worked with, they share this very admirable trait of defending their vision above all, you know. There's just no room for compromise. It's the life's work. And just stay on the E. Okay. And add a little, like, yeah, yeah, it's in the E, it's a little, okay? Nice, better feel. You, you could pare it down even a little more. Just drama when you're playing more dramatically, too. Take coming after all that thing, that's what it needs. shows where all six of us hug each member before we go on and it's a huge important part of the show because sometimes when you're touring the day is just miserable and boring and maybe you're getting on each other's nerves a bit but then there's that hug right before the show and it's like remember we're here to do this thing for these people and it's good important work you know Swans have always been an epic sounding band. And now finally, the music has quite literally an epic form, you know. They're big pieces with lots of, lots of layers. Ear damagingly loud. Well, Conventionally speaking, doing yeah. it every night is. Yeah. That's another reason to wind it down. Is 
I'd like to hear my children's voices. Michael wants to stand in the middle of the maelstrom of the sound, and um, and I, I don't know how he's done that for so long and still has any hearing left, because I have hearing damage and I can't handle loud volume for too long. Yeah, there's operations they can do now for ear damage. They replace every little hair. I would like it. My hearing's fucked. Do you have tonight? I'm beyond it. But did you ever have tinnitus? Uh, not until this version of this band. Yeah, because you know, you can have hearing loss without tinnitus. Sure. You can have oh, I have tremendous hearing loss. Yeah. I'm unfortunate. Every once in a while I get the musical note thing, but uh, generally yeah. it's like the waves of the sea. It's just shh. Yeah, yeah. If I'm in silence, it's like just shh. Okay, you do have that. Yeah. It's just, yeah. <laughs> We had a great bonding moment the last time that they came to Atlanta about everything that was going on in his life. We began to reattach as friends, like, and really kind of have the connection again. For Michael to ask me to come and to sing Blood on Your Hands, it was a very healing moment for me. So it was a very, very uh, important gesture. I had a tremendous uh, spiritual uh, bond and downright love affair with, with swans. something that you've given so much your heart to and you've worked so hard in for so many years like you kind of feel invested in a intimate way you know like your spirit is connected to it and then of course I consider all those guys brothers really I understood every millisecond of what was happening up there as an architecture. I understood it, and it felt weird to not be part of it. It felt weird. At the end, the way they finish the shows, they all come to the front of the stage and bow and they're all smiling and happy. You really feel they've gone through a battle and they've come out of it and they've done brilliantly and they stand there and they're smiling on the stage. They feel like they've done a day's work and I love that. A lot of groups would just do feedback and walk off stage. That all makes it very special because he's so intense on stage, it's so other on stage and then Michael goes straight to the merch stand and starts interacting with the fans which I think is great. I suffer from anxiety and tonight shift to something. Oh good. Thank you very much. Well, it's, awesome. it's like fuel to me when someone comes up to me and tells me that the music has helped them through hard times or that they've found something true in it and how much it means to them. That's incredibly rewarding. It's fortifying to know that I'm not doing it in a void and that it actually has had an effect on people. It's so sick the way people get sucked up into the whole celebrity thing. What a stupid way to look at existence. You know, you have this short period on Earth and you're gonna waste it thinking you're some big deal that's so stupid. So people, if they care about the music, they pay to come see it, they buy things. I think it's important to meet them, you know, find out what they're about. Hello. Hello. I'm really unprepared, I don't have anything to sign. Oh, I'd be happy to sign that, yes. It's my ticket. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Thank you for being here. Thank you, cheers. It's been incredible. Thank All right. you. Thank you. To be kind blew my mind. 
and mm -hmm. it's changed the way I listen to music and um, the way it's so brutal and vicious and hard to listen to but the emotions are so raw and everything it feels bigger than you are in a sense something about it is kind of moving <laughs> but in like a weird transcendental kind of way when I listen to it I don't feel like I'm in control whatsoever or I know what's going to happen even though I know the songs a million times and it feels kind of like leaving my body Hey, how's it going? I'm oh, great. That was an incredible show. Oh, good. I've never experienced anything like it. Oh, good. That's what I like. Hello. Hi. Hi. Mind-blowing stuff, absolutely brilliant, and yeah, yeah, for sure, it just completely blew me away like nothing else I ever heard before. Hey, you got a bootleg shirt on, man, take it off. <laughs> it's fantastic that some of these kids are the children of people that went to the shows. It's definitely the L word, legacy, I mean, it definitely is. My dad. For your dad? We always, always come father and son through sponsor. Oh, that's great. And it made me discover. Seeing Michael again after all these years was seeing like my brother. Good guy. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? Great to see you. Yeah, yeah. Historic occasion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's kind. There's very few people I know in my life that I can just sort of like see after like, ten years or so, and it's like not a day has passed. You all right? All right. And Michael's certainly like that. I mean, it's been longer than 10 years. I mean, he's still got his band. I don't, I don't have Sonic Youth anymore. Oh, he's making huge statements now. And his swans, their concerts are complete experiences. Are you ready? We're going to do a uh, collaboration on I'm going to be your dog, right? <laughs> you do that? I'll play the bass, even though I can't. <laughs> probably, yeah, probably, you probably know better than I do. I just, I just <laughs> This is a really incredible for me to be playing with Swans right now because I don't think I've played with them since 1983 when I was just three years old. accepted right now, that's really great for him. And his 
place is completely sold out and everybody is standing there and they're listening and they're all loving it. To experience that in that part of his life, finally, was such a glorification of like, you know, of being an artist. I was so happy and I was so proud that he was like able to be there and doing that. I think Michael stands in the pantheon of committed artists, artistes. <laughs> you know, here was a guy who had a vision and he was not fucking around. He did it and then he kept doing it and he kept doing it and he unflaggingly committed himself to his muse and his inspiration. He's had a huge impact on a lot of artists. That's what matters. I always thought that history would be very kind to the swans because their output has always had an honesty to it and a real mastery and an artistic vision that is so unique and impossible to imitate, really. So they carved for themselves the hard way a very, very definitive artistic niche and it will always be I think a really fertile well of artistic content for people to return to in 20 years and 50 years because of its integrity and purity and mastery. has to be a next, an evolution. As an artist, you're always going to push until you fall over the edge. So maybe Michael just hasn't found the edge yet. Drifting goodbye on a rust-colored cloud. as a group, as these six people, that we have kind of reached the pinnacle, the top of what we can do. And anything else would be starting to, like, eat your own fingers or your hand. It's just time to uh, breathe a different air. Will we see you again? Squeeze from our breath The ocean it's incredibly spirited of Michael to call time on this 
iteration of Swans, when it's still building and people now have very much a love for it and he can play to very large audiences around the world. I think he's once again doing the true artistic thing of saying, this feels like it's about to get comfortable and comfort doesn't equal good art and now I'm gonna scrap it and start again. Yeah.
especially for Swans concert. I came from Tempe, Arizona. I came from Providence, Rhode Island. So tonight I came from Montreal. My son Joshua and I came from Vermont to see Swans. Love of Life was the first album I think I listened to by them and I was just really into it, yeah. I flew in from Mexico City. From last week, from Vegas. I came from Denmark. I come from from Sweden. I came from Tulsa, Oklahoma today to see Swans for the first time. I'm 13 years old. I've been a fan since uh, late 2016. Heard To Be Kind was my first listen. My dad is also a Swans fan. I got him into Swans, actually. <laughs> so this was extremely important to me. Swans is a really special band for me. And it's really emotional because it's a Swans on last shows. Friends of mine came here from Paris, and yeah, I think it's a big deal for people. stunning ups and downs. They've had the kind of career and dogged self-belief and self-determination that will make them an enduring name in music. And I think it's a name that will only kind of grow in time. to exist. I think it's a positive force. It's definitely an act of love, I've realized. So that's a good force to have in the world. And meeting people who experience it and get something true from it is a huge reward for me. Um, I feel like I've done, I've done and am doing something worthwhile with my life, you know? I think I called Michael last year in a drunken state, not him, I was drunk. I told him that I still consider him a, a fellow traveler on the same strange path.
unless you're making something, creating something, you can't be actualized or whole or kind of have a sense of being in your skin or in your body unless you're doing it. You just have to keep on. It's, you know, you, some people might say it's a compulsion, but it's, it's your DNA. Shit! see why it would stop now. You carry on to the bitter end until you drop, you know, you drop and that's it. And you've had it. I will never stop until a Samsonite-shaped tombstone rests six feet above his head. I have to work. You gotta keep working. A person's life is consumed largely by the work they do. And if you're tenacious enough and fortunate, you can figure out a way to at least subsist on doing the thing that you were put on earth to do. I mean, giving up is not an option anyway. What else am I gonna do? You have a 